You should have a copy of today's sermon. You can follow along and some blanks for you to fill in and just help you to comprehend and be on target. I guess most of you had watched the news this week, all the horrific things taking place in America. You think what the rest of the world thinks of our nation. And when you see what supposedly... um, a nation founded on Christian principles and doctrine, and it seems like we have fallen a long ways away from our foundational moorings and what we have attested to. Um, in Texas and in Ohio, Ohio this week, 31 people lost their lives from mass killings. And you can pull up and Google on the internet and look at the statistics. In fact, in 2017, 181 people lost their lives due to mass killings. And try to put your head around these things, try to understand what in the world is going on. And you look at what political aspirants are saying and you listen to what the media is saying and trying to find an explanation, a solution. They talk about gun control, talk about mental illness, um, these games that uh, young people and older people are playing, which are just out living out in their mind and fascination of just taking a weapon and just killing and slaughtering people and You think, what kind of effect does that have upon the mind where it just anesthetizes people and doesn't think anything about it? And then you see these solutions put out with the racism in America and um, when people want to blame religion. Look at the Crusades and see what's happened in history. It's amazing in the 20th century... um, through just not religion, but communism. And uh, more people were killed as a result of what Hitler did and Stalin did. And more millions of people lost their lives than compared to what happened in the previous 19 centuries. And you look to see, well, if we eradicate all guns in America, will that solve our problem where you see in the French Riviera a man taking a truck and just driving down uh, a walkway and people losing their lives or someone using another weapon such as a knife and things like that. And So I, I said to myself, what is the root problem? I mean, if we deal with all these things in a peripheral way, but we don't deal with the root. It's like when you go out in a garden and you want to make sure your plants are getting all the nutrition and you see the weeds growing up and the tares, you want to get down and pull those things out, just not by the top, but you want to get the root. You got to get the heart of it, the root of it. If you don't get the root of that weed, it's going to take nutrition from the rest of the plants. When we planted this garden out here, we're diligent about pulling out the weeds and getting rid of all the parasites so you could have a good fruitful plant which would produce much fruit. When you look in the Bible historically, you look at that generation that came out of the uh, exodus, out of the slavery and the bondage of Egypt, and they were in slavery for 430 years. You had that generation that saw the miracles in the hand of God and said, surely they would recognize that God is their deliverer. And then you saw that wilderness wandering of 40 years. It shouldn't have taken them 40 years to go from Egypt into the promised land. But something was happening in the hearts and minds of those people. In the book of Hebrews, the third chapter Beginning in verse 8, let me read this to you. It says, that generation, those people who saw 
those miraculous signs. I mean, their clothes didn't wear out. God fed them, provided them with water and manna and food. It says here, he says, a warning, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, provoked me, and saw my works for 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. It seems like mankind, humanity, cannot learn from the lessons of history. And what happened historically in that generation, 3,500 or more years back there, and essentially what happened, a heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And they started complaining, and I recall what, one thing they said, we were better off back in Egypt eating the leeks and the garlics and the cucumbers and having that. So we would prefer to, instead of walking by faith and trusting God, return back into that horrific lifestyle that they endured. Something happened within the heart of those people. And probably out of a million and a half, maybe two million people, how many walked into the promised land? Two, Joshua and Caleb. And here they had God who was leading them and guiding them and directing them. Now I'm real careful not to judge those people because I thought, well, what if I lived in that day? Would I have been one of the few who walked into the promised land? Would I have fallen into the majority? And it causes us to begin to think about what's happening in our day and time. I was talking to another believer the other day. He says, it seems like and I think this is true in America, that people who hold fast to a biblical worldview, who believe the Word of God, who order their lives according to the truth of God's Word, are in a minority. Does that seem accurate? Are we a minority? And then you see the teachings of Jesus in the book Mark chapter 7, if you are turning on your iPad, your Bible, or whatever means you use, I have this here, and then I got my, I don't have it with my iPhone, but I have the Bible on iPhone, and it's neat, you can turn and turn to that and find it. Mark chapter 7. And Jesus is teaching a parable here, beginning in the 14th chapter. And he called all the people unto him, and he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him or corrupt him or cause him to be unclean. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And then the disciples said, well, explain that a little further to me. Verse 18, he said, and so with understanding also, do you perceive that whatsoever things come from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him. Things out there in the environment, in the world, out there. He says, because it entereth not into his heart, but into his belly, and goeth out in the drought, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of a man, that which is defiles him. From with, for from within, out of his heart, 
of men proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and fornication and murders and thefts and covetousness and wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile a man. What Jesus is saying is the evil that we see at any time, any generation. It's not from without. He said the problem that we see, which is so predominant even in our day and time in our culture, the problem is within the heart of man that deceives, defiles, corrupts. And out of the heart of man, evilness springs up. And so what we're doing in our nation, trying to resolve this spiritual problem, the evil heart of man, by all these peripheral things. So we get rid of all guns. I mean, I don't need an automatic weapon to go deer hunting. In fact, I don't even use a gun anymore. I listen to the American Indians. I use a bow to harvest wildlife. And there, there are things that we have we don't necessarily need. But even if we change our political thinking and if we enact legislation to try to get this evilness under control, that won't do it. Look at what prophetically the Word of God says in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'm just going to very quickly uh, make reference to what's being said here. It's talking about before the return of Christ, there's some things going to happen. And those things are happening today. Now, I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but I know today we're closer than we were yesterday. I mean, the return of the Lord could take place relatively soon or it could maybe be another thousand years. If you look at the third day teaching, the first thousand years, the second thousand years, maybe another thousand years. I don't know, but it tells us to prepare our hearts and be vigilant. And it says here that before the return of Christ, there will be a falling away from God and the truth. Is that happening? Yeah. It, it says that the spirit of Antichrist, that which is against Christ, will be clearly manifested. Simply man saying, I am a God unto myself. So you don't have to necessarily look for someone being raised up in the Middle East who becomes a world leader. But when John in his epistles wrote about the spirit of Antichrist, he said it is already in the world now. And we've been living the last days since the day Jesus announced it. The spirit of Antichrist, that which is against Christ, that which denies that Jesus is the incarnation. And you see a lot of religions espousing that today. You see people who are embracing the spirit of Antichrist don't even realize it. We see a, a certain sense of arrogancy in our nation where we have essentially said to God, we don't need you, we can handle this ourselves. And people put more confidence in the spirit of man than in the spirit of God. The mystery of iniquity, or another word, lawlessness, if you're filling in the blanks, a clear disregard for the sanctity of life. And lack of civility, accusations of racism, intolerance, division, hatred. That is so manifested now more so than ever before in America. These are warning signs. What that causes me to do is not become fearful, but press in more to God. I am 72 years of age in good health, and I give God the glory. But 20 years from now, I'll be 92. That will come by quickly and go by rapidly. 
My concern is for my congregation, for my community, for my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. I went to my high school reunion last month or two months ago, the end of June, and I grew up in a small town. I could ride my bicycle anywhere I wanted to. I, I knew every street, knew, grew up with the people I graduated from high school with. There was only one high school, a small town. I never was introduced to any drug. No one ever came up to me and offered me a drug. No one ever offered me a cigarette. I smoked one cigarette in my life when I was 18. It made me sick to my stomach. I said, this is stupid. I'm not saying I was the perfect person. You heard what in my mom's funeral what they said about me. I got more whippings than Dan and Sheila and Carolyn put together. My nickname was Righteousness. No, <laughs> my nickname was Rebel. And But, you know, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And so the devil was beat out of me. <laughs> but what, what I'm saying is now you see this mystery of lawlessness is so prevalent in our culture. Whereas years back, thinking about Back in the 50s and 60s, not saying there wasn't any issues or problems, but nothing like it is now. The working of evil is definitely at the hands of Satan, as it says here when Paul wrote this letter to the church of Thessalonica. And he goes on to say, mankind will be unable to embrace the love of the truth, the gospel, and be saved. People will suffer the wrath to come. That's the existential threat, not global warming. That's the existential threat in America. Essentially, what's happened here in our nation is that we as a nation have turned our back on God just like they did when they were coming out of Egypt. A heart of unbelief. They talk about postmodernism. Postmodernism is essentially saying we don't know what the truth is. Truth is not objective, not based on a foundation, which we base truth on, the foundation of God's Word. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. And postmodernism says that truth is subjective. You decide what you think truth is because all roads lead to the same place. There's a lot of brilliant people who believe that. A lot of smart people, high IQs. And when they hear the gospel, it's foolishness to them. Had a dialogue with an atheist not too long ago. And praying for that guy, a friend of mine. And I said, You'll never understand God intellectually. He's not a mind, He's a spirit. It's called a faith relationship. I said, you say I can't prove the existence of God. I said, you can't prove to me your father loved you. You say it, but how? give me the evidence that your father loved you, that he lost way back in the 70s when a drunk driver hit his dad's car. Maybe that was a point where he became ang angry and bitter towards God and turned away from God. You see, when a crisis comes into any person's life, when you lose a loved one, one or the other thing is going to happen. You're either going to be compelled into the presence of God, who is the only one who can give you comfort and hope beyond the grave, who can come alongside you and pour the bomb of Gilead upon you and bring healing, when you have a loved one who's suffering, who's battling for their life, or your, or your world's being turned upside down, hopefully you will be catapulted right into the presence of God and otherwise people turn away from God and run away from God and there's no hope in that. 
that will bring, bring destruction, depression, bring a person down. I think I lost my mom Monday morning, and I grieved. I held, I could feel her spirit leaving her body. But you know what? I'm going to see her one day, soon. Amen? I know because of what God's Word says. Be not troubled in your heart, for I have gone before you, and I have prepared a place for you. Then I read in the Bible where it talks about the fact that God knew us before he framed the earth and persuaded that neither no devil, no demon, nothing in this world can separate us from the love of God. Amen? And so what's so sad is that when people turn away from the truth, what happens, they open themselves up to be tormented and led astray by the enemy who is in control of this systematic world mindset and philosophy. And God says when, when people do that, they embrace a strong delusion that they will believe a lie. You see, the solution to America and this evil that we see is not something out there. In the sense, it's an environmental thing. It's uh, all these other things that people come up, try to explain why this, if we just can get good legislation, then we can resolve this problem. Jesus said the problem is, is in the heart of man. That's where evil emanates from. A person grabs a hold of a thought. They take that thought. They conceive it down in their heart and mind. And it begins to develop an ungodly evil belief system. That gives them the priority to go out and do the things they're doing. Think about it. One thing that Bob, God says he hates Six things, yea, seven things are abomination to God. Proverbs, the sixth chapter. One thing is the shedding of innocent blood. Our nation is guilty of that. And what it does, it devalues human life. And the sanctity of life is just cast aside. You see that. And we even have political platforms that embrace that, that ideology. I just started looking at the arrogance in our nation. And I pray for America. I love my nation. I think it's one of the greatest places in the world to live. But I see what's happening that spiritually we're on a decline. In 1962, prayer in the Bible was removed from our public schools. Steve was talking about how God corrected him and dealt with him this morning when he was a senior in high school. And... He was corrected because God loved him. And you know who corrected him? His high school principal and the superintendent. And they invoked Christian principles in saying, we love this young man. We're going to direct him to the straight and narrow. You think that would happen in our public schools today? That principal would be fired. In 1973, Roe versus Wade legalized abortion. Recently in New York City, where I came from New York State, they applauded when they passed the legislation that they can abort a baby up to the third trimester and even thereafter, which moves not into abortion but infanticide. You think that is pleasing and that's going to lift the value of humanity in our nation and honor God? People are now punished for mentioning God at public graduations. I have been told when I had participated in some public situation, do not pray in the name of Jesus. And I did pray in the name of Jesus. When I went up and was asked to dedicate the National Cemetery, I was a Protestant representative and there was a Catholic and a Jewish person. And I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was at a 
5K race in Woodstock on Independence Day. And, and they asked me to have the blessing. I prayed in the name of the Lord Jesus. I wasn't trying to be offensive because I know that in his name, we pray for people to be healed. In the name of Jesus, we cast out demons. In the name of Jesus, we pray for people to be resurrected and life and strengthened. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So where are we going to shy away? Not purposely trying to be offensive, but want to honor and glorify the Lord. Christmas manger scenes have been expelled from public property. The Ten Commandments are not allowed to be displayed in public places. It's easier to preach the gospel in a small village in a former communist country, which I have done and shared the gospel in public schools and here in America. What's going on? Our responsibility, because we have the truth, we cannot depend on the government to turn America back to Jesus. We cannot depend on our educational institutions to turn America back to Jesus. We cannot depend upon the U.S., I mean, the, the Wall Street stock market to turn us back to Jesus or our business enterprises. Who has the truth? Who has the responsibility? Who's the arm and legs and hands and feet of Jesus? The church. Amen. And as we draw closer to that day when God announces the consummation of the age, we draw closer to that, those who hold fast to the truth will be persecuted, and that's happening. It's just not an attack from the federal government, but the state, even local governments. So I conclude my sermon today. What is the answer to this spiritual decline in America? What would ye say? What is the answer to the spiritual decline in America? We have to stand and preach the truth and love, do it in love and explain to people our way out of this crisis. We need a heaven sent, sky blue, tongue speaking, glorifying move of the Holy Ghost who would come and grant repentance to this nation and God have mercy. We need that. We need that in America. And when we see all these things, I mean, there's a lot of things I think that need to be done, but essentially the problem exists deep within the heart of man. That's why I find it's so necessary for you and me to continually renew our mind with the Word of God. Amen? That we, we have an altar that in the morning or whatever time you choose that we go to the Word of God because we are being bombarded bomb, bombarded with all sorts of garbage. Even when you watch a movie that was back in the 60s, you get the commercials. And you see things and an affront to the holiness and righteousness of God Almighty. You have to censor things. Amen? Praise God for your faithfulness, for your tenacity, for your willingness to be a shining light. One thing that I mentioned this week when I was eulogizing my mom's life, it was a, a quote from Ravi Zachariah, who lives here in the land. He's a Christian apologist, brilliant mind. He said the thing that concerned him concerning Christianity is not that we don't have the inability to give some answer to some of the people who are skeptics and who are looking and searching for the truth. It's not our inability to come up with the answers. He says, the thing is, they hear what we're saying, but a lot of people who profess to be Christians are not living out what they are proclaiming and what they say is the truth. That's a form of hypocrisy. If we say we're Christians, then what we need to do is show the world 
that the light of God's holy presence lives within us. And that what we say, we see it being lived out, how we act and how we behave. Because that, a lot of times, will be a lot more convicting and stronger as God uses that to touch the hearts and lives of people. Amen? So, one of the best things we can do is put a bridle on our tongue. One of the best things we can do is that we speak the truth in love. One of the best things that we can do is that we show acts of kindness, that we love those who speak against us. We love those who attack us. We love those who revile us. We can attract more bees with honey than we can with salt. And so what we need to do is let the light of God shine within our hearts and we can begin to see our nation turn back to God as we do what we're called to do in our sphere of responsibility, our community. Can you say amen? I was this week up at the outlet mall Went in there, finally broke down to get my iPhone fixed because I baptized it back in March for half an hour in Lake Altoona. That, song, that iPhone needed to repent. That iPhone had made confessions, but it needed to walk through the waters of baptism. But it came out, it was still corrupt. So I took it to a healer. A young guy's working over at Outlet Mall. It was called Cellarius. Took it in there. And so when I picked it up, I noticed a guy had an accent. He's from Australia. And uh, we we're talking about what we we're talking about today. I brought up the conversation. I'm a person who never talks about religion or politics. Never do. That's all I talk about. Anyways, I had a conversation with him. And I said, we can follow the examples of other countries like Australia has done away with probably 600,000 firearms and their crime rate has dropped and this. And they still have issues and problems. And I said, we can... uh, pass legislation, do these things. But I said, what, what really is the root of the problem for all this evil and this, and this horrific mass killings in our nation? I turned, one guy was probably in his early 20s and the other guy from Australia was probably 40 years old. And I said, see if you agree with me. The problem with the evilness in our nation is in the heart of man, and we have turned away from God. And they agreed. I don't have no idea what they, their belief system is, but they agreed with that. So we, we see an opportunity. We don't particularly try to get in a debate or an argument, but just sense when there's an open door, to speak the truth. Amen? If you would, please stand.